Are we ready to start? I guess we lose our chance. <laughs> well, let's see, in about a week we're going to do QRP appeal. It's the QRP TTF exercise or program. Um, as most of you know, we do this every year. It starts off kind of like a picnic and whatnot, but QRP TTF is actually an event that happens across, at least around the United States. Um, the actual event runs from about six o'clock in the morning local, or no, eight o'clock in the morning local time to about six o'clock in the afternoon local. This year they have a, uh, a theme to it, which is called the river runs through it. So people take their QRP uh, transmitters, which are the low power transmitters, they go out in the field, set it up in a park or something that has a river through it, and they use the exchange of the uh, signal report, uh, the state they're in, and the, the river. Well, we don't have a river running through our park. So we classify, or we are classified as a field station. So we're gonna be doing the RST, Vienna, and then the name, which we'll probably use half, I assume. But anyway, that uh, gives us a chance to take any uh, low power transmitters that we have, set them up in the park, and uh, go ahead and operate on the HF or you know, any of the HF bands. This year we're doing something, or we're going to add something to that because a lot, you know, only about three or four people may actually have transmitters running, and you may have 15 or 20 people out in the park. So what uh, what I did is I, well, I'll explain a little bit more about it, but uh, what I did is I uh, decided to add a hidden transmitter challenge for people that have a two meter rig so that they can try to find some transmitters that I'm going to hide around the park. I've got a presentation that I'm going to uh, run. This is going to be narrated. It's almost like a video if you want to call it that. But uh, this will explain more about it. And go ahead and watch it and we'll see what happens. to the QRP hidden transmitter exercise. This is a presentation done for the Vienna Wireless Society by Mel, KI4, WKZ. Well, let's get started. A little bit of background. QRP, as most of you know, is a Q code for low power operations. In this example, transmitters will be running about 15 milliwatts, which is truly low power. We had some old transmitters that were used several years ago for a, a fox hunt activity, and they were found in our storage locker. These uh, transmitters have been repaired, they've been reprogrammed, and they've been made ready for this operation. So what's needed to find the hidden transmitters? Well, basically, you're going to need a handy copy Set it for 147.455 megahertz, narrow band, FM, receive only. You we'll need a directive antenna or a directional antenna. It's very much desired, and we'll explain a little bit more about that later. A compass will be very handy when operating out in the park in order to get a bearing that you get from your antenna. You'll need a map of the area, and we'll be providing that. This will be a map of the park that we'll be operating in. If anybody has any other direction finding equipment that they'd like to bring to the QRP and to the field activity, just to uh, have for show and tell, that would be fine. Or even if you have something that you'd like to try and locate the hidden uh, transmitter, you can do that too. All of these transmitters are going to be operating on the K4XY call sign. I'm going to be explaining a little bit about some simple antenna options. I'll introduce 
disk of transmitters. We will select one of those transmitters and an antenna to do a graphical demonstration. So we can do that in this presentation. While we're doing that, we can also explain the strategy we use to find the transmitter using one of these antennas. Also, at the end of the presentation, I'll show you a map of the area that we'll be using. And if you're interested, there will be a, an optional scoring if you'd like to uh, compare your results in the event that you'd like to do it, maybe more than once, or simply to compare your results to somebody else. Now, the antenna options. There's a few different ones that you can use. These are all fairly simple antennas, and we're not getting into direction finding equipment or anything like that. Those are just things that you can use with an HT directly. Probably the most popular, the one that a lot of people use, are the Yagi antennas. The Yagi has a, a directive pattern where it is a strong beam in the front. And it has a very weak lobe at the back of the antenna. We can actually use this to our advantage while we're trying to locate these transmitters. So this is uh, one good option that somebody could try. Another one is the loop antenna. This is actually a view of the loop looking down on it, so that's why it looks a little flat. But it basically is a figure eight pattern when viewed this way. But the most important part about the loop is actually that it has a null in the direction perpendicular to the plane of the antenna. And that can be used to great advantage when trying to direction find. This is the uh, pathway dipole. It has a figure eight pattern when viewed from the top like this. And with has a null right off of the ends of the wire. Now, unfortunately, because you're so close to the ground, if you were hand holding this antenna, you would probably only be four or five feet above the ground. So this uh, pattern really becomes more omnidirectional. It may not be useful for a direction finding activity. This is just your standard width antenna. You can imagine this looking straight down on it. So it has an omnidirectional pattern. With the omnidirectional pattern, you probably wouldn't be able to use it for direction finding the way it is or the way it's shown. However, one thing you can do is to put yourself near the antenna and block the pattern in one direction so that the back side becomes a null, whereas the front side becomes the normal signal coming in from some source. This will give you a, a simulation, if you will, of a pattern which looks a little bit like the Yagi, but uh, not quite as good. But it might be possible to use this as a uh, web method of finding the transmitters. Now, the actual transmitters, we're going to introduce those one at a time. There's five of them. They'll be located out in the field in different places. This is our first transmitter. This is MOE. So he's going to be sending a Morse code call sign of the K4XY followed by his identification. It'll sound, the identification is going to sound a little bit like this. Hi, Deb. And anyway, he's going to uh, be one of the transmitters out in the field. Now, the most important character on these identifications is going to be that last character. And we'll see how this develops here in a moment. So he's going to be the single diff. Are you ready, diff? Okay. Here's the second one. Um, this is MOI. And we sometimes refer to him as Dip Dip. How are you doing today? Okay. 
Oh, this is a little cute. This is going to be MOS. So he's got the, he's, he's got three bits. Yeah. You doing okay today? No? <laughs> there you go. You don't want to fool people. This is, uh, this will be probably MOH with the four bits. He's going to be helping us with the demonstration, so you'll see him a little bit later. By now, you probably figured out who this guy is. That's M05. How you doing today? Okay. Anyway, the transmitters are all going to be out in the field, but they're not going to be transmitting at exactly the same time. Each transmitter will be running for about one minute. Then it will shut off for a duration of about four, four to five minutes. So it will be on for a minute. Then there's about a 10 second gap and then the next transmitter will come on. The next transmitter will do his one minute of transmission. And then it will go off for 10 seconds and then the next transmitter will come on. And that pattern of one minute on and about four, four and a half minutes or so off, it's going to repeat. The actual sequence, you won't know. You'll have to discover that by listening carefully to the transmitter found in the field so that you know which one is which. Remember that last character with the dip, the two dips, three dips, four dips, and five bits are the clue as to who's who. So each transmitter at the end of the one minute period will send his call sign K4XY followed by one of his identification codes, the MO and the character for the, the actual identification of the transmitter. All these transmitters are going to be on 147.455 megahertz and their transmitting is less than 50 milliwatts, which will give them a range of maybe two to 300 feet. So, uh, depending upon the conditions out in the park, we should be able to hear all of them in most places that we might put the transmitters. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's try an example of a strategy to find one of these transmitters. Well, MOH has volunteered to help us with this, so let's put him on the map here. Hi. How you doing up there? Now well, you're not three. Okay, that's four. All right. Anyway, he's going to be out in the field, and we're going to, he's just going to be transmitting every minute, and then he'll go off for a little bit, and then he'll come back on again. Now what you want to do is locate a couple of spots on the map that you want to use to do your direction finding. Now on this example, I'm just going to place a couple of locations. They can be arbitrary, nothing critical about it. The only real, well, the only one thing that is critical is that you know where these spots are on the map. So just keep that in mind. On this uh, demonstration, you're not going to see the map right away. So here's an example of the first location. Here's the second location. Probably the only requirement you want to make is that the distance between the two probably should be somewhere around 100 feet apart. It's not critical. It doesn't have to be that distance, but uh, just to give you a suggestion on what you could try. Because the park isn't very big, so uh, you just need some significant space in between them. And hopefully you're still within range of the transmitter you're looking for from these two different locations, which you won't really know until after you've been out in the park for a while. So let's bring our operator in and see if we can uh, use, figure out what the strategy is he's going to use to find those transmitters. Okay, we've got an operator. He's going to be using the Yagi antenna, which is probably the easiest to understand because of the shape of the antenna and whatnot. Now remember that it's got gain in the forward direction 
and it's got a null or a very low gain on the back. We're going to use that to an advantage here while we're locating these, locating the transmitter. From where he's standing right now, he may actually be able to hear the signal from the transmitter. Is, uh, he's got a little bit of gain in that direction. He might be, he might be actually picking it up, but he doesn't really know where the transmitter is yet. So let's put him on a, one of these uh, blue spots, and we'll go from there. So now he's at a known location on his map. He's picked this out previously, so that he can use it. The way he's pointed right now is actually pointed towards the transmitter, so he may be hearing the transmitter, but he doesn't really know where it is yet. So he starts moving his antenna around, back and forth, and trying to locate the antenna, or locate the transmitter. Now the one thing about this uh, Yagi is that the beam is not real sharp. It's got quite a, an angle to it. So his ability to actually say which direction that transmitter is coming from is not real good. So we're going to try a little experiment here and, and use the, the backside of the antenna to create a null. So here he's turned around and he's got the null pointed behind him. So what he's looking for now is a weak signal, trying to make the signal as weak as he can and trying to determine where the transmitter is by the null, rather than trying to make a strong signal, trying to make a weak one in his receiver. So I'm going to move a little bit around. When he finally decides that he's got it pointed in the direction that he thinks the true null is, he'll then mark on the map from his location the direction that his antenna pointed and put a line on his map. Now he's going to move over to the other location and basically do the same kind of operation. Here again, he may actually be pointed off in the distance here, but he, he may receive the signal, but he's got to try to locate a direction that would be the bearing to that signal. One thing about the AG antenna, this is uh, because it's close to the ground, sometimes the pattern gets distorted because of the proximity of the ground. And you may not be able to do very good direction finding with it with it in the horizontal position like he's showing it. What you can do is simply turn the antenna 90 degrees and hold it vertically. And uh, you may be able to get a little better angle or a little better uh, direction finding capability with it. So here he's uh, moving around again trying to find the, uh, the strongest signal. And there again, you can see there's, there can be quite a, a range of uh, directions, so you know, he could be all over the place looking for it. However, if he turns around again, now he's searching for a null. Find the weakest signal rather than the strongest. Once he decides he's got a pretty good null, at this location, he'll then draw a line on the map that corresponds to the antenna direction again. And he just draws the line across the map. The point at which these two lines cross is most likely with the vicinity of the transmitter. So, how do we do out there, H? Okay. Now, there's actually going to be five transmitters. From these two locations, which you've marked on the map, you can probably locate all five transmitters using the same strategy that we've just demonstrated. For example, here's another transmitter this is five. 
we saw in this journal earlier, as noted by these two lines. We'll call these the lines of position, which is really a, a better term for them. Here's MOE. There again, he's got his line of position from the two different spots. Here's MOS. He's got these positions. Nope, here's MOI. He's out at the intersection of these two lines. It actually goes from here, right? And there they are. So, he's located all five. Now, let's, uh, let's take a look at the map of the park and get some ideas on how this is going to work in the actual world. We've put together a map that shows the park, which is this green area. There's a few landmarks on here that uh, we can use. There's two parking lots, one down in this area. There's another one up in this area. There's a pathway that runs through the park. There's the restrooms are down in this area. This is a uh, baseball diamond. These are uh, tennis courts. This is a children's play area. This is a shelter where picnic tables are. This is what they typically call the upper shelter. This is a larger shelter. It's a lower shelter. And then this is a small covered area down here where there's some picnic tables. Now during this experiment, all of the transmitters are going to be located within the green area. They're not going to go outside the park. On the map, I have placed a grid. The grid is somewhat arbitrary, but by using the, uh, the grid locations and the landmarks, you may be able to uh, discover where the, you know, how this grid setup is designed. Anyway, there's uh, sections A, B, C through H, and then we have one through eight along the vertical axis. Up in the corner there is a uh, compass rose which is pointed to true north. So if you have a compass and you're going to draw your lines on here, you have to remember to take into account that there is a small, small deviation for the magnetic compass versus the true north. Anyway, this is the map. What we're going to try to do is see if you can determine which grid quadrant the transmitters are located. For example, this spot right here would be C4, whereas this spot up here would be F5, and so forth. But you don't have to find these transmitters you know, with great precision. You just need to get the right general area. If you're locating your uh, reference points, you could try different places along the pathway or the shelters or wherever you want to do it. But uh, you've got different options. And that's really up to you how you do it. Just as an example of what you could do to score these, score yourself, the first item is really the transmit sequence of the Fox transmitters. What you uh, place up here are simply the order in which you hear the transmitters. For example, if you heard MOE first, then this would be MOE. If the next one you heard was MO5, put the pattern here, etc. And fill these out. If you get it correct, remember these are just uh, looping around, so it doesn't matter which one you start with, it just uh, you get the right sequence. But if you get that sequence correct, you give yourself five points. Now the nice thing is you can do this even while you're eating a hamburger with your H2. You don't even have to be out in the field much. So this is an easy one for you. 
The next one is, did you locate the transmitter into the correct grid square? So here you just put in the name of the transmitter, for example, MOE or MOI or whoever, and you say he's located in grid square, you know, C4 or F5 or whatever. If you get it correct, give yourself 10 points. You try to locate all five of them, or as many as you can. Now here you get some bonus points if you get the more than one correct. Let's say you've got two correct locations, you could add five points. If you've got three correct locations, you could add ten points. And remember, these add up, so if you've got three, you've also got two. So these will add up. Look at a total score. The maximum score is 105. And that is about it. So, I hope you all have fun and enjoy the event. Did she do get credit for those sketches? <laughs> well, actually, I did those. <laughs> you did? Oh, it looks kind of like her drawing. Uh, just as a little bit of follow-up on this, um, yesterday I went out to the park. I located some, I put, I determined some locations to put the transmitter so I already know where they're going to go. I don't know which order they're going to be transmitting in. That's for you guys to figure out. So anyway, that's the basis of this little activity and, and it's just something that's going to be fun to do, that's all. It's not a contest, it's just, actually it's a, it's a good training exercise for, it's a good training exercise for if, you know, people don't really have much of an opportunity to try to locate a transmitter in this manner, and uh, so this will be a good chance to just practice. Yes, sir. So if we're the first person to get to the transmitter, can we? Would you like to do this on the... As I explained it's earlier, Mike? It's not a serious question. All right. No. If you Able find a transmitter and relocate it. <laughs> if you find a transmitter, just leave it where it is. Um, but here's another thing. If you're walking through the park and you say, oh, there's one over there. Oh, I see one over there. That's, <clears throat> you can do that. You may be, be successful at it, but if you don't have a radio, you're not going to tell which Who's who? So that's the important part of this too. Yes, sir. Another silly question. Is it going to be vertically polarized or horizontal? You don't know. Don't know. Okay, <laughs> so if you have a Yagi guy, you're going to be doing this. Just like you're doing the field. And they may not be all the same, but who knows? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so I, I remember the last time we used these was at Nottoway Park. Yes. And Tom Martindale hit them. And they were, he hit them, I mean, they were hidden. They were like underneath the bleachers. <laughs> so you could actually come, come in on them and like, well, where is it? Because he had actually had, you know, physically concealed them. So are you going to try to hide them into, put them inside the tree trunk or, or try to actually no. hide them and make it real challenging? No, obviously, because of the, the way I set this up. All you have to do is just kind of get it in the right grid square. You don't even have to see him or find him. All you have to do is say, well, okay, I think he's over in C5 or F12 or whatever. And I'm not going to try to uh, bury him or anything like that. They'll, they'll just be out there. However, I, I should warn you that they are in camouflage bags, so they're not going to be that easy to see, even if they were in plain sight. Yes, sir. Um, are the timers on those good enough that uh, there's no danger of one catching up to and passing another? That's an excellent question. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> those, uh, the transmitters are the same transmitters which Pete mentioned, or that uh, Lee mentioned that we used in Nottoway Park about uh, nine years ago. I've taken all those transmitters, I've gone through all of them, I fixed all the cold solder joints. Uh, fixed some parts that were in the wrong places and stuff, <laughs> and uh, got all the transmitters working in an identical manner. That was just the hardware part of it. The other part of it is that the software that's inside of these things has been completely redone 
And getting the timing on these things has turned out to be a very tricky job because these transmitters do not have voltage regulators in them, so they depend upon the batteries holding their voltages up. Um, to keep the timing? To keep the timing, yes. Uh, the one thing I've been thinking about is that we'll do this little experiment and see how it works. If people are interested in us doing this again in the future, in the next year or something, we might reconsider using the, or redesigning these transmitters, putting some proper voltage regulators in them, and getting the timing a little bit uh, better because they are free running, like you mentioned, and they will have a tendency to drift over time. Now, the testing that I've done on them, the transmitters, I've run them for about four hours, and I've been able to keep them all separate. Um, if you let them run for a long time, you know, six or seven hours or something, they will tend to drift into each other. If you get two of them transmitting at the same time, it's going to get confused. But, Not if you uh, haven't really known. But I can't guarantee that even during the time of this event that they won't drift into each other. So there are some technical issues involved with this little experiment too. But I, I, anyway, I'm just setting this up so that the people who are interested can have something to play with. That's it. Go so home. before we take off, if I think I caught people, okay, I think I caught some of you, but I know that not everybody signed in. So the group over here apparently didn't sign in. Uh, big thanks to Kirk tonight for the food. Yeah, Kirk. Sure. Sure. Right. Oh, right. yeah, sure. The Labor Committee, Ross, where are you? Right, right. Ross came right. together the for the new amps. We didn't advertise it. It was pretty much a, a word about thing among the techs, mostly the techs. You may or may not know, I have kind of a, a special dialogue going with the techs. Give you a statistic. Right now, we're at about 31 members who have not uh, renewed their membership out of 200. That's not too bad. But here's a statistic. Of the 31 members who are not renewing their membership, 10 of them were new members last year. So a third of the new, third of the people that have not re-upped have chosen not to re-up, or they don't know they're supposed to re-up. That's not good. That's the reason why we're putting some special emphasis on the guys that are new, guys and gals who are new. And that we're done this evening. Mm -hmm. Do sign my roster. Mm -hmm. well, you you sign the roster, make sure right. it's right. accurate with regard to your AWRL membership. The club needs to know if you're an AWRL member. Okay. Whatever it is you have. Yeah, that's a nice box and it's got some nice binding holes. It might have a speaker in it. It says it's a sweet so we crack the device, maybe. Maybe. I don't know, I'll take it apart. Let me find out what it is. Good luck. Please put your chairs back with big lock. Well, this one goes right here, but the... Uh, and, yeah, but the... Uh, hey, Yasek? Are we good to move this so we can put the chair back? Yes, yes.